on this edition of The Self-Publishing Show. It shouldn't be a stress fest. So therefore, if one of our editors just thinks, this book's great, I love it, I want people to read it, we'll publish it, because why not? Publishing is changing. No more gatekeepers, no more barriers, no one standing between you and your readers. Do you want to make a living from your writing? Join indie bestseller Mark Dawson and first-time author James Blatch as they shine a light on the secrets of self-publishing success. This is The Self-Publishing Show. There's never been a better time to be a writer. Hello, it is Friday, the 17th of December, very close to Christmas, and I'm all Christmased up. I'm James Blatch. I'm Mark Dawson. I'm not... I'm not Christmas up. I'm wearing a Joy Division t-shirt. You've got the which... most miserable band of all time with the <laughs> ironic quite... name Joy Division. Do you know why it's called uh, Joy Division? No, I don't actually. I know you're a big, big fan of all that. Well, Ian Curtis stuff. Joy Division is worth it's worth a quick Google. I'm just going to make sure I get my facts right. But um, Joy Division. I should was... say if you're not watching on YouTube, I'm wearing a ABBA Christmas jumper knitted by Bjorn and John Hurt, and you're wearing a Joy Division t-shirt. So, yes, Joy Division, um, this is from Wikipedia. To avoid confusion with the London punk band Warsaw Pact, the band renamed themselves Joy Division in early 1978, borrowing the name from the sexual slavery ring wing of a Nazi concentration camp mentioned in the 1955 novel House of Dolls. So, Fantastic. yes, it's, it's, it's a pretty grim, it's grim name. Yeah, very grim. The whole thing is grim. Well, and a slightly grim, but also, I think, a nice note. Uh, a very good friend of ours has died, unfortunately, uh, in his 60s, very young, um, very suddenly, but he was a big uh, music fan. He and his son went to gigs all the time, and for his uh, for the wake, everyone has to wear their favourite band T shirt, which I think is a really lovely thing to do for him. So, it will probably be Pink Floyd for me. It'll be the Beatles or Pink Floyd, but I think probably I'll pull out Floyd because he was a bit of a Floyd guy as well. But um, well, I, 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 I suspect there'll be some Joy Division there because they're just one of those bands, aren't they? That um, yeah, absolutely. trendy people like you like. Right? Yeah. Normally, I would um, at this point I would take the piss out of you for your music choices but I won't on this occasion because I approve of both Pink Floyd and the Beatles so you're you <laughs> absolutely, absolutely fine on either of those oh, good okay yes you do have a go at me sometimes anyway what about ABBA I've got my ABBA oh no uh, no I like ABBA yeah everyone likes ABBA okay look um, if you're not watching on YouTube this all is meaningless it's just two disembodied voices but it is uh, it's our penultimate episode before Christmas we have one going out on Christmas Eve uh, which I suspect you might listen to after Christmas, who knows. Um, but we have some good, two very good interviews. So today is uh, a man who's pioneered indie publishing in the UK, the sort of uh, hybrid, in, what do we call them? Hybrid publishers, because you're sort of half indie. They have indie methodologies, but it is a mm. publishing contract, and um, which is a different term, use of the term hybrid. And uh, Rachel McLean, who is a Kindle Storyteller Award winner for this year, and she does a very good interview next week about the specific steps that she's t she took to get commercial success. So before all of that, though, we are going to talk about TikTok, which is uh, uh, our focus. It's going to be our focus in the new year. We're going to make 2022 the year of authors getting onto TikTok. Where they're already, the pioneers are already there, and it's booming, and they're doing very, very well. And we have been very impressed at, at seeing the results of people who are uh, getting onto the channel. And it's not just romance authors, and it's not just women. They are, I've been looking through this morning. I've been editing some stuff we're doing for January, and there's been... Uh, yeah, male sci-fi sci authors, for instance, are doing really well on there as well. So how did you get on there? How does it all work? We have something that's going to help you get a foot into the world of TikTok. Do we not, Mark? Yes, we do, James. We have our expedition. So we're not calling these challenges because that's a little bit that's been done. So we're calling these an expedition. Um, so we're going to do an Amazon expedition later next year, but we're going to start with TikTok um, and um We've got uh, two, uh, Lila and Jane, two really um, expert um, TikTok expeditioners, I suppose, trying to kind of squeeze this metaphor as, as far as I can, um, who are going to take you through over five days, uh, five short videos with, with, um, with a little bit of homework, a uh, Facebook group to go with it. And we will introduce the, what TikTok is, um, how to get on it, how to set your account up and how to start, you know, get your first video uploaded using the TikTok video editor. So... I've seen the uh, early videos. They're really, really good. I think it's going to be really a, a lot of fun. I might do it as well. I'm, I'm certainly not an expert on TikTok. Um, and so it's something that I can learn too. And since we, I mean, we announced it a week ago, we've had 3,000 um, people uh, who are going to take this expedition with us. And I think over 1,000 now who are actually in the Facebook group. So it's going to be a, a fun and vibrant um, uh, little uh, adventure for us all to go on as we uh, as get out of 
2021, tell it to piss off and get into hopefully uh, a, a good way to start the year next year. Yeah, and if you want to take part in the challenge, of course it's all free. Uh, a very useful thing to do, as Mark says, by the end of the challenge, you will have had an account set up and uploaded your first TikTok, uh, and which is a great platform to start with. Uh, you go to selfpublishingformula.com forward slash TikTok, simple as that, T-I-K-T-O-K, and sign up. And as Mark alluded to there, we have a Facebook group dedicated to authors on TikTok, uh, which is growing quickly, and uh, you can be in on in on the ground floor if you sign up via the uh, web address i just gave out you'll get a in an invite to the facebook group as a result of that um good okay i'm looking forward to it as well and i think there's there's definite scope for the field that i'm in in military history there's quite a few military history um uh, accounts on there not just in the book talk world which is like a hashtag a world within tiktok but uh, I can find, I think, people like should me will also, be able to find audience. Before I forget, we should also add the As For Authors course opens early January. I don't think we've compl- we have we have got a date, but it's early January. Um, and as a part of that, we're going to have um, a, a TikTok for Authors course, which if you are a, a member of the Ads for Authors course, you'll get that for free. Um, but it will be worth, you know, uh, it, will, it will take the expedition and, and put up to the next level. I think it's, it's 10 hours of content I, I heard from Jane and Leela last night. So... Uh, James is going to be very busy editing that, and it's it's going to be really really good. So we'll have more on that as we as we open the uh, registration period up for ads next year. Yeah, I'm editing it now, and it's going to look very different from our previous courses because there's a lot more production that goes into this. I'm using green screen and methods like that, which is great. Oh my goodness. Um, yes, I know. Uh, now. Um, uh, yes, 12th of January, uh, ads for authors opens. We'll talk more about that uh, in the new year. Okay, so get on board with TikTok. We now have our interview, and it's Jasper Joffe, uh, somebody I think you spotted um, a couple of years ago. And I remember you saying to me, Jasper's longer, longer than that, or was mm. it time flies? I think so, um, yeah. Four years You probably. noticed just how well he was doing. A couple of authors, in particular in the mystery, uh, crime mystery uh, genre, and Basically, a glance at the charts told you that he was killing it uh, with them. Uh, Faith Martin is one. Joy Ellis. Uh, Ellis is the other. Uh, but he's now got a stable, as you'll hear in the interview, of many, many more authors. He's got a team, I think, of 12 full-time employees now. He runs a small business there. Uh, the great thing about it is it's a much much more equitable split between publisher and author than uh, authors have been used to traditionally. So instead of getting sort of five eight, nine, 10, if you're lucky, 15% of revenue. Uh, uh, and I can't speak for individual deals that Jasper does, but much, much closer to a fairer sort of 50-50 split uh, in the same way that we run as well with few. So uh, we're big fans of Jasper, really interesting guy. Interesting to hear how he's approached marketing, how he organizes himself, and a little bit about how he selects his books if you're an author who wants Probably to worth uh, in be case part you- of the stable. Didn't cover it in the interview, which I don't know because I haven't heard it yet. But he, one of the ways he approached marketing was to take the Ask for Authors course. So he is, uh, he was yes. an early, an early adopter, one of the earliest to take the course. And he's, um, he's very big on Facebook ads. I've seen a lot of book bub ads now from Jasper as well. So he's clearly getting into that and and Amazon too. So yeah, he is, um, he he certainly had a start with the SPF um, methodology. He's probably. Uh, tweaked it a bit now and made it more suitable for what he does but you know he he's living proof that um digital advertising is a very very good way to quickly uh, build a, a, a publishing company yeah he mentions it unprompted by me as i ask him how how does he uh, focus <laughs> right. on his on his ads and stuff he says well i take mark dawson's course and i make sure everybody in my company takes mark dawson's course so <laughs> yeah we do get a free we do get a free plug on that okay look here's uh, here's our chat with jasper This is The Self-Publishing Show. There's never been a better time to be a writer. Jasper Joffe, welcome back to The Self-Publishing Show. I think, I think the time you were on before, did we interview you at the London Book Fair or did I interview you? No, it was from my office, but uh, it's good to be back anyway, James. Yeah, well, I was very excited to meet you the first time because um, it it was a point where I was saying to Mark that this is is how indie, indie the indie revolution is happening in people's bedrooms and kitchens, but actually I think the fundamental change to publishing is going to happen at your level and now our level with Fuse Books where authors for the first time get a much fairer, equitable offer from a publishing company, very different from the traditional um, setup. And in the end, 
why would authors sign a, a an eight percent deal with a big five publisher when they can go and get a much more a much fairer split from people like us? So I think that's this is the revolution, right? Uh, yeah. <laughs> so anyway, I, I've been very enthusiastic about this right from the beginning. Uh, tone, in fact, um, <laughs> I often mention that yeah, we, we're we're part of something. I don't know if it's a. I think it is a revolution. I think I, I was reading a blog post by actually one of my authors, and he was talking about the early days when it was all kind of easy, and now we're in a different place. The the markets changed even for indie publishers and self publishers. But it, to me, it's all part of the same journey. We've we've come a long way, and there's still lots more to do. I'm not seeing any end to the runway, as they say. No, um, no it is different, and it is tougher at the moment. This year, I think, last six months got quite tough for, for individual authors and for publishing companies. We'll talk a bit about that in a moment. But why don't we catch up a bit with the uh, with the Joffy Books history, which I think starts actually starts earlier than I thought it started. 2014. Yes, around then. Um, so, yeah, we, I mean, I was talking to another publisher of a big, bigger publishing company and they were going, oh, we've been doing this for five years. I was like, actually, we're, we're quite old now. Um, seven. Um, so we started with just me. Um, uh, I remember the first time I saw my phone, we'd sold a couple of pounds worth of books in a day. And I was sort of like, wow, you can sell books. <laughs> um, you know, you just uploaded a, manu- a word manuscript to KDP and then suddenly you gave it away free. You gave away 10,000 copies and suddenly you were making money every single day, the small amounts of money. Um, and that was seven years ago. Uh, today we are selling, going to sell 3 million books this year, uh, our best ever figures. Um, we have close to 100 authors working with us in one shape or form. Uh, we have just increased our staff numbers to 10. So we're double digits. Literally today, uh, our 10th staff member started, which is just amazing to me. Uh, that's the, the other bit I would like to talk about, which is working with a bigger team, which is actually really fun. Um, and our author, Joy Ellis, last year was up for a book of the year. I have to check it on my screen. Crime and Thriller at the British Book Awards with Ian Rankin, Lucy Foley, Richard Osman, Lee Child, and Robert Galbraith. Wow. I mean, on the short list for that. Wow. And that was one of my proudest moments because she's one of the first authors we worked with. She's a great author, wonderful woman, um, Joy Ellis. And just, you know, to be on that list, you know, I think our books are fantastic, but it's lovely to get that industry recognition as well, yeah. as well as all the sales. Yeah, so Joy, Joy Ellis and I think it's Faith Martin as well have probably been your two, they were the two standout authors in the early years. Is that still the case that you have two or three authors accounting for a larger percentage of your sales? We've um, we've sort of diversified. I mean, Joy and um, Faith, I love their names, Joy and Faith yes. <laughs> sold around two and a half million books each, um, which is huge. Um, the wonderful Helen Durant has also sold a million books. She's, I can remember her email coming in. I always say this, just like saying, you know, I've self-published. I'd like to work with someone. I just remember thinking, this is good. We can do this. Now she's sold a million books. But we have a lot of authors who've sold 200,000 books, 400,000 books. You know, some brand new authors, some backlist authors who've come with a, quite a big backlist. Um, Roy Lewis, who sadly uh, passed away. But, you know, we've sold 450,000 of his books. Um, you know, just brilliant books that were published in the 80s. So, you know, we worked with with these backlists and even Nicholas Rhea, you know, of Heartbeat, um, who publishes with us, we've sold, I think, 200,000 of those, you know. So, you know, we have a lot of authors with actually fairly substantial um, sales, and really good authors. Yeah. And uh, you say you've got 100 authors now on your books? Thinking, well, you know, I personally still authorize all the royalty payments. So I think we paid out something like over 90 royalty statements last quarter. So, you know, I was getting up there. Yeah. And remind us if it's not confidential, maybe it is, what what sort of deals authors get offered? Can you give us a kind of ballpark of what, what people can expect? Well, it's substantially more than traditional publishing. I can't give the exact figures. Obviously, it's confidential between us and them. The thing we don't do is, you know, traditional publishing is life of copyright. So it's 70 years from when the author dies. So if you sign a book deal, generally with traditional publishers, your books are stuck with them for forever. I mean, effectively, we go for a much shorter term. We only renew the contract if we make you some money. I mean, which seems absolutely self-explanatory. Um, and we pay quarterly, which I know some publishers actually pay monthly now, but quarterly 
with all the paperwork and everything else seems much better. So we start, we start earning money for authors much more quickly. We, we produce books much more quickly, even though there's lots of editing, we still have a quite a much more accelerated schedule, I suppose, than most publishers. Yeah. Well, you know, we've, I, I model a lot of what I do with Fuse Books on you because you are the gold standard, I think, in this indie <laughs> area. I love quarterly, by the way, because we do monthly and it is, it's a busy few days at the beginning of every month. Yes. I mean, with so many authors and such, I mean, I think, I can't remember what we paid out last quarter, but I think it was either it was half a million pounds, I think. Um, don't quote me on that. Uh, you know, if we paid out monthly, and then there's always something, you know, you have to like correct or, you know, like, you know, yeah. like it would just be, we'd spend all our time doing paperwork. Uh, quarterly seems a fair, uh, fair balance. Yeah. Um, if my author was listening, they're going, no, no, monthly is much better, James. <laughs> but, uh, there you go. We'll have, we'll have to make, well, this is, this is part of growing, isn't it? Is, is making these decisions about, uh, about structuring your workload so it's manageable um so at the moment i can get away with just putting in a hard day's graft on the first yeah. or second of the month but i guess it got to the point or, or things are getting to the point with you where you needed help when did you take on your first person um it was a few years ago um and there were uh growing pains shall i say um you know we'd done everything with freelancers as you know the sort of way of doing things you know so they're once you start having, you know, payroll and employees and, you know, like it becomes more complicated and what, how they actually add value. So I saw in the first year, I think we, we took on two or three staff and actually our sales went down or at least our revenue went down in some shape or form because we just actually didn't get as much done. Um, and then I saw as, as we got the right people in the right positions, we just, we could do a lot more like, for example, entering our authors in competitions, going to um, events. Um, we've just hired um, Kate Lyle Grant, who was the publisher at Seven House now to be our publishing director. Of course, she's got this amazing traditional publishing background, you know, 10 years, I think, or more as the publisher at Seven House, which is a great crime fiction and print uh, publisher. Um, and now she's joined us and she goes to all the, she'll be going to all the events. She also, has wonderful contacts with agents and authors who, you know, we've had to be been flooded with submissions since she joined us. So there's a point where there's sort of growing pains of taking on stuff. And then there's a point where you can do a lot more. And we saw in the last year, our, our revenue and our, our, what we could do just massively grew. And I think suddenly I realized we could keep growing uh, with more stuff. Yeah. Uh, and what's, what does your day look like today in terms of, I mean, a few years ago, you did everything. Uh, open the spreadsheets yeah. in the morning, open the KDP <laughs> dashboard. What are you doing exactly. now? Click on a few things. No, it wasn't that simple. But um, <laughs> Well, we have a quite a civilized office schedule. I mean, honestly, I work and many of our sort of more senior people work a bit longer than that, but we work 10 till 4.30. Um, many of us have parental responsibilities or other kind of responsibilities. So, no, it gives us, gives us quite a... Um, a sort of flexible schedule and we work half from the office half from home so i've got four people in the office i've got our, our new marketing team in the office today so there's three of them in the office um so i have a morning meeting with everyone just get things going discuss the days they you know answer emails so you know the usual lots of emails lots of strategic things what's this what this kind of more staff is enabling me to do is to think about what else we can do for our authors yeah. how else we can grow the company what other opportunities there are because i still i mean i, I always sound like i've swallowed the kool-aid but i really do believe there is just so much we can do because we have and we learn from your SPF a lot. We have all the kind of uh, agility and knowledge and like scrappiness of the self-published author. They're always looking to find the angle, like to work out how you sell books, how you reach readers. And we have that. The one thing I have realized with all this, we have this direct relationship with readers because I used to answer every single email from our readers. So, you know, and we have this huge mailing list. So we have all this feedback coming in all the time from readers. So, if you think about a traditional publisher, there's so many layers between the publisher and the reader um, and the author. You know, there's agents getting involved. There's, uh, you know, PR companies. There's all this kind of like layers separating you from knowing why a reader enjoys your book and, and what the author thinks about that. You know, like those those things are crucial. So, 
you know, like there's just this amazing opportunity to take all that knowledge of readers and authors and to have some of the, the big infrastructure and big spend of traditional publishing. You know, like last year, we spent a million pounds on advertising. So, I mean, it's, it's a huge budget by any standards. Like when I talk to traditional publishers, I'm like, whoa, that's a lot of money. Um, you know, so we can have that and yet we can have the agility of self-publishing. Yeah. Just, uh, just talk about the advertising for a second. So you, in, you know, for me, I think this the lifeblood is the, the paid ads, which drive, drive mm-hmm. sales and mastering that is, is, is what we do in SPF, but it's, it's a crucial part of, of success. And the authors who come to me saying, you know, can you publish my books? That's what they don't, they can't get. They can do covers. They can write blurbs necessarily. They might not like doing that stuff, but the bit they're, mm. they're scared of and they, and often turn out to have not run any ads at all because they just don't know how to get going. Now, you ran those ads mm-hmm. in those early days. Yes. How, how, how do you find someone who, who can apply themselves and get that level of mastery when you, you're growing a team? I send them to the SPF course, actually. <laughs> of course. <laughs> Good, <laughs> correct answer, by the way. Yeah. I mean, this isn't product placement. I think it's excellent. It's an excellent, I mean, this is not, I'm not sucking up. I think it's an excellent grounding in the entire advertising world. You know, like it, it helps you do Facebook. God, I sound like I am actually doing no. an ad for you guys, yeah. but <laughs> it helps you do Facebook, AMS, you know, book yeah. button. Those are the three key levers that we want to use. Um, it's not easy, actually. I mean, recruitment, we've just tripled our marketing team. We used to have one other marketing person and I supervise marketing. And now we've gone up to three people. So we've got like, we've got someone just for social. Great. She's got 400, Sasha, she's got 400 followers on YouTube. So, you know, she's leveraging all her own. Uh, and she was a, a published author herself. So she really understands that world. So we brought her in to do our social. Um, and then we have someone who actually ran a publishing company, another person, Alex, who's going to be um, doing our like day-to-day sort of Facebook and all those kinds of ads. And, you know, actually then without employing 20 people and 17 people in analytics and 14 people in, you know, ad design, it's actually hard to get the correct skill set for these kinds mm-hmm. of positions because you need to be able to, Uh, You need to analyze data, you need to be able to make great ads, you need to understand what the books are about, you know, and you need to be on it all the time. Um, And you need to spend lots of money. Of course, we have loads of learning from seven years of intensive advertising. So, yeah. It's a, it's a Liam Neeson thing. It's a very particular set of skills needed for uh, for paid advertising and um, not everyone has it. That's, I think that's the one thing I find the rarest is is that ability and I, I think maybe traditional publishing struggles a little bit because you almost have to live and breathe paid ads for a bit you have to be slightly yeah. obsessed with them and 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 um and in a big corporate environment i don't think you get that kind of loyalty to your job that gets people inside under the which is why i'm, I'm interested in how you've you've managed it and how confident you feel that you've got somebody with that level of intensity that you and i you used to have and i have today yeah, well, fingers crossed they do have it. But I mean, uh, our new marketing manager has only been in the job three weeks. Um, right. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it really is about just being, it sounds stupid, but sometimes I just say you've got to be on it all the time. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and you've got to be like fiddling around with things. That's Facebook ads. I mean, we actually have an external um, AMS guy now because AMS is such a, uh, I don't know if this is getting too technical, but you know, AMS is such a huge thing with, we're running so many ads, um, that it's just too complicated, you know, with like endless, like tweaks and sort of, I don't know, duplicate. Yeah. I don't know. It's very complicated. AMS I found I used to do it myself and to really be in the old days, it was slightly simpler. It was easy to easier to get a a return on investment with AMS ads, but now just become there's so many th- sort of levers and types of ads you can do um yeah this is this is amazon ads right and um yeah uh, what sort of uh split between facebook ads and amazon ads do you think you do in your budget well, roughly similar okay. um that's interesting uh, i mean we still think facebook is the biggest driver of sales uh i mean i personally love them they're very simple to see but um yeah, I mean, I still think that's one of the big advantages of indie publishing is that we're selling direct to the people who are buying the books. So people are clicking on a link, buying a book, hopefully, um, you know, rather than, you know, I don't know, a billboard where people walk by and think about it and might wander into a bookshop a week later. We've got ads where people are, where people buy books and and they're, they're using them to, you know, 
to yeah. actually buy books. And that is the power, isn't it, of, of indie. Um, yeah, it's interesting, isn't it, that observation about the, the, the dashboards? Because I think the Facebook ads dashboard is, on the surface, much more complicated than the Amazon ads dashboard. And yet the reality is the other way around. I think Facebook ads are relatively simple once you've got stuff in place. Amazon ads, I struggle with Amazon ads. I mean, I struggle... I can I can run Amazon ads campaigns, no problem. I can lose money on them, absolutely no problem at all. In fact, <laughs> in fact, it's quite difficult to lose money on them because they won't even if you don't get everything right, they don't even serve your ads. It's, That's right. It's a nuanced platform, isn't it? The Amazon ads. Mm. One. Yeah. Well, you'll have to teach me. Well, we'll have to get our guy to teach you. I don't know yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Or introduce me to your guy. That's actually another possible possibility. Uh, you're using he's an agency, is he? Uh, yeah, he's a sort of uh, sole trader, I would suspect. Um, oh. He does. He actually he doesn't only do books. He does other products. Okay. I don't even remember how we found him, but um, he does a reasonable job. The return on investment, I think, you'll have uh, be seeing. I guess you're getting this feedback from from people in in your group, but you know the return on investment on both Facebook and Amazon ads isn't always great anymore. Hmm. I mean, we think of building momentum for a book, so we we get it in the bestseller chart. Um, it it triggers the Amazon algorithm itself, but you know we lose money on lots of ads. That's we're spending so much money to get books up there in the charts. Uh, at the moment, we've got two books in the top twenty, I think, on Amazon UK, um, and the number one in Australia. Just to yes, I saw uh, that. I was going to ask you about Australia and, and other territories. Is this something you're you you invest ads into? No, we don't. That's the weird thing about Australia. Um, I don't know if I'm getting too technical for you. No, not audience. at all. This is, a um, this is a technical podcast when it comes to ads. Okay, well, that's fine. Um, I forget, it's not a sort of infomercial for Joffy Books. Um, <laughs> or, or SPF, yeah. <laughs> or SPF. Yeah. Um, yeah, we don't... I mean, we have our mailing list, which has actually got a fair number of... Um, mailing list is so crucial. It would be the other thing I would, I would think to talk about. But... Um, yeah, we get to number one in Australia seemingly without running any direct ads there, which is strange thing is that the Australian Amazon algorithm seems to be triggered by either the UK or the US algorithm because it's it close actually closely more closely follows the UK sales ranks. That's interesting. Um, mm. Yeah. So in terms of your growth, um, Jasper, do you find um, that you are doing things? Are you still in your comfort zone when your day is involved in in personnel management is quite a far cry you're, you're suddenly a, a manager rather than yes. a doer aren't you has, has that been a transition you've been comfortable with well i mean to be fair um the brilliant emma grundy haig our editorial director does um a hell of a lot of the managing of, of people um but yeah there is a lot more uh yeah, I'm just talking to people. But it's actually quite fun. I mean, what the thing I didn't realize, and I never really worked that much. I'd been an artist, so I'd been sort of like yeah. do it yourself. Um, it's actually really fun achieving things with a group of people. Uh, you know, like when something good happens, you have this real sense of satisfaction of like we did this. We, you know, and of course you have all the authors, which is wonderful, and we celebrate our successes. But then there's like our team of Joffy Books, you know, uh, workers as I call them. Um, <laughs> you know, we we really enjoy our our good moments, our number ones, our getting shortlisted for things. It's 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 really much more satisfying in some ways working with a bigger group of people. One thing I suppose we have to consider taking people on, and we've just taken, we have probably, we have one person on PAYE and one person about to join, I think, for SPF. And I, I use VAs at the moment for Fuse, yeah. but I have to be aware at some point that you've got to have that rather tedious human resources stuff in place and be prepared for a challenging situation with a, an employee. That's true. And um, that's something, you know, people are sick people have things go on in their lives. You know, you realize you have an obligation to people after, you know, like it's not just, okay, come and work for us and do this, this, and this. I mean, obviously it's obvious, but uh, you know, like there are, you have a responsibility to them and things happen to them and you sort of deal with things, you know, we've introduced, I don't know, bereavement policies, for example, horrible thing to, to talk about, but you know, we, we've have, you know, paid time off for those kinds of things. We have mental health days was just introduced, you know, so people can just take a day off when they feel like they need a break. You know, we've extended mm. our holidays um, because, you know, we work really hard and it's very intense. So there's all these kinds of aspects that I never even thought about, really. Um, mm. and, and 10 to 4.30, you're going to be inundated by applications to work at Jockey Brooks <laughs> after this uh, 
Well, to be fair, I have to say people do work longer than that, but those yeah. are the set hours here. Yeah. Um, Clever. Um, okay, so let's talk a bit about the books themselves. So the submissions, I remember you said to me once that you could tell, without reading a whole book, you could tell fairly quickly whether a book's going to work or not. Do you still, I mean, you've got so many submissions now. How do you deal with that process? We still have open submissions. So you just go to our website. We have our submissions details. Surprisingly, about probably half the people who submit to us just don't read the submissions details. So we say, like, send a synopsis, send the whole manuscript, right? And then you put something in the email about who you are and what the book is. Just people send all sorts of things. They send 20 sort of PDFs of each chapter or, you know, like you never know what you're going to get. Anyway, we have open submissions. Someone reads all those emails. We have a we have a bit more of a complicated process. They all go to our reader um, and then she compiles a report of all the submissions we've had that week and sort of highlights ones that might be of interest. And then our editors also have access to that inbox. So basically we have a great big email inbox, which the entire company can look in and say, this is really good. Um, and then we have a meeting like once a, once a week or once every couple of weeks where our editors say, hey, Jasper, we think this is really good. What do you think? And then I look at the email and have a read and I can still not always, I'm, I'm by no means infallible on this from the email and from the first few lines of the book or just diving into it. I can usually tell whether it's probably got potential. Um, it's amazing though. I mean, it is amazing how uh, there is something, you just see it. There's a magical quality to something that's going to work. Well, I mean, maybe it's all in my head, but there is a magical quality to a great book. I can remember the emails of many of our best-selling books coming in. Right. Gosh. Well, even the way the email's written. Even the way the email's written. It's just, it, it's partly a lot of experience now, I guess, with reading them. But even in the early days, it's a sense, I mean, I think some of the best authors have a, have a way of communicating, which is obviously to be able to tell a story. And even when you write an email to a company, to a uh, seemingly anonymous email, if you can tell that story and if you can express yourself just in the email, yeah. you're going to have, you know, you're probably going to be a better writer than someone who just writes, I don't know, dear sir or madam, see attached, you know. Yes. <laughs> Sounds like an intriguing beginning to a novel, though. Um, a great opening line for a novel, though. Um, <laughs> Yes, in fact, <laughs> my, my, my tip to... <laughs> the... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Dear Sir Reynolds, see attached, it all begins. Um, yeah, my top tip actually is is the email submission. We get obviously a lot of submissions as well, is, yeah. is to make it less about why you need the contract and more about why the book is good for the publishing company because it's surprising you'll get a long email explaining, you know, sometimes quite personal as to why they mm -hmm. need this contract. Uh, in place and I'm thinking but but I'm making a decision not you know I, I'm very sympathetic to your situation but I can't make a business decision based on your but it's surprising how often that happens yes I think and just I mean it's not always the case because not everyone understands the marketplace but just understanding where your book is like if you say my book's a bit like whatever the number one bestseller is that week you know it shows you've kind of understood what the genre is. The one, the thing I say, and which everyone in the company gets tired of me saying, and this may only be for us, but, you know, understanding what kind of book you've written is so crucial. Like uh, almost the thing that seems to kill sales is just not being quite in one thing or the other. Yeah. You know, like a really clear, you know, cozy mystery or a crime thriller with a, DI and a DS or, you know, or a really great psychological thriller with a brilliant hook. Like I want to see that clarity. And because I know that when we, we edit the book and we do so much work on it, when it gets to the, the moment we have to sell it, we're going to be using the clarity of understanding of the book. And I want all our editors and everyone in the company and all our marketing people, what is this book? Why do people want to read it? What What is the, I hate the term, unique selling point of that book and where does it fit in the market? And you have to understand that in order to sell it. Otherwise, who are we going to sell it to? Yeah. So when an email starts, um, my book's unique, it's unlike anything else and you can't define it by genre. <laughs> not, not a good start. Uh, I mean, you know, I don't want to be prescriptive, but my heart does sink. <laughs> or they say, you know, it's a, it's a cozy mystery with an alien. And I'm like, well... Okay, <laughs> so, I'm up for that one as well. So I don't know BDSM, you know. Like, don't <laughs> see how this is going to work as they do. 
Well, the, the Sea Attached series, which I'm now developing in my mind, um, I think it's a it's an intriguing legal thriller with a sexual twist. So it's, yeah, uh, uh, Hughes books, I think, would yeah. be your first part of it. <laughs> I'm not touching it. I'm telling you now, uh, but uh, I'll, I will submit it to you. Um, good. Okay, so you have your you're you're still pretty hands on with the submissions. I really like that. Just the company wide, it's a really good thing. In fact, I know a few very successful well sort of film companies that we used to knock around with in our BBFC days, the the newest intern was listened to as much as the person who'd been there for 20 years. In fact, more so because the person who'd been there 20 years knew that the 17-year-old went to the cinema three times a week with her friends and was very picky about what they saw. So that's a really good way of of discovering talent and um, uh, and using your resources properly. Yes, anyone in the company can basically say, I think this book is great. Um, we should publish it and we'll, I will listen and we'll make a decision. Um, also, I always say to our editors, you know, like if you love a book, we can publish it. We have the resources, you know, even if it, even if we're not quite sure it's commercial, I'll say, you know, look, just let's try it. You know, life is too short. The, the thing I realize, obviously, as I get older, as we become a more established publishing company, it's also meant to be fun and enjoyable. This whole thing we're publishing books. We're not saving lives. We're not, uh, you know, making guns we're we're doing something which we we sell to people this nice thing this thing that an author has put so much work into and which we've put a lot of work into and it's a book people read it for pleasure and so our job should be kind of fun and pleasurable not like i say it pretty much three times a week it shouldn't be a stress fest you know and so therefore if one of our editors just thinks this book's great i love it i want people to read it we'll publish it because why not yeah. Now, what about other formats, Jasper? In your contract, do you cover audiobooks and hardbacks and print on demand and so on? We do. It depends on the author. Um, if if the author wants us to cover those rights, we I think I may have told you this in the past. We have a brilliant like sub rights agent called Lorella Belli who goes to all the book fairs and knows everyone and sells our rights where we have them. Um, we will go with pretty much all rights because we can sell them on behalf of the authors or we will go for less if they have an agent, for example, themselves or they have some way of selling those rights. I always say to people, like, you can have 100 percent of like all your rights and not make any money from them or you can you can share them with us and you know we can all do all right. Um, the big one is obviously audio rights now. Um, and this is I am thinking that we should be running our own audio department Um it's just because it's such a huge deal. Um, uh, so that is something with with me working on other strategic projects, uh, something I'm thinking about. The other a- avenue is, of course, the paperback market, which is 98% of our sales are digital. So why can't we have more paperback sales? These are the two big areas, audio and paperback, which I'm, I'm really excited about. Yeah. And, and do you mean moving beyond the print on demand alongside the ebook on Amazon to trying to get your paperbacks in, in High Street? Yes. Um, I, I think our authors are fantastic, that we know that people love them. To me, it seems a no brainer that they should be in Smith's, mm-hmm. that they should be, you know, in airports, they should be in every Waterstones, they should be on those tables. The, the truth is, and I've spoken to a lot of people about this, it's actually really hard to get, get them in there. You know, we, we're willing to spend the money, we're willing to do the distribution, but it's very still very old school is how I would describe it, how that works. And it's very long lead times. It's complicated. Mm. Um, yeah, we have um, this one big company in the UK seems to have a stranglehold on all that distribution. I suspect they are old fashioned, but I suspect they, they want to be more lean and agile and, and open to all these amazing indie books that are selling loads, but they are struggling to modify their systems and which ultimately yeah. do rely on physical trucks trundling about. Yeah. You have to store some paper in a warehouse. You have to deliver it to a bookshop. You have to do that months in advance. If the people don't buy the books, they have to be returned to the warehouse and then yeah. some more accounts have to be done. But I still just think if people like, it's not that different. You know, people love books. They love a book, whether it's on, doesn't matter what format it is. They read it, they listen to it, they buy it in a bookshop. And to me, we have all these authors who are selling millions of copies. So presumably if someone found them in a bookshop, they would also buy the book because they're really good. And we know that people like them. Um, I don't get that. So there must be some sales in bookshops that we're, we could get. Yeah, I think. definitely. Um, 
And George, just going back to the audio books, you talk about potentially setting up something in-house. You talk about setting up a production facility in-house. I don't think we want to produce audio books. I do follow all of your uh, kind of things with these, and it looks complicated to me. Mm. I think there are people who are better at producing audio books. What I do think is we can sell the audio books because, you know, effectively audio is a digital product. People are buying it from their computer, from their phone, from whatever device they are on. And we're very good at selling digital products. So, my thought is we work with another company. I don't know why I'm telling you this, but all right, fine. I'm telling everyone this. It doesn't matter. Um, well, it's just an idea. I, I, yeah. yeah, it's just an idea. We are in talks, but uh, I say we work with another company. We create a Joffy Books audio imprint, and then we use our marketing skills and our marketing team to, to push the sales of those. It's complicated because of Audible, actually, because the Audible platform is quite self-contained, and it's most of the audiobook market. Um, and it's actually quite hard to advertise. I mean, I do read a lot about this. It's quite hard to advertise directly into Audible, if you see what I mean. Yeah. Is this getting too technical? But no, yeah, the... no, no. You can't get too technical for this particular uh, okay. podcast. But, yes. So I'm, but I do think essentially we are great at digital. So audio effectively is a digital product. So, um, would, you so... Ha- would you develop your own player? For people, I mean, I know a few no, people are doing we this. Just, but... We would just be the publisher in a more. At the moment, we sell lots of rights in our audiobooks to other companies. Like oh, we okay, sell to yeah. Audible, or we yeah. sell to Findaway, or you know, Tantor. I think we should be the publisher yeah. uh, of the book with someone else, and yeah. then be the ones sort of like because every time you, every time you have another player in the line of rights, they take a chunk of the money, if you see what I mean. Chunk of yes. our author's money, chunk of our money. And they do a good job, but I think we should be marketing directly our own audiobooks to through the major platforms, if you yeah. see what I mean. Yeah, that makes complete sense. Well, I think I'm going to do that with my own audiobook. I'm not, you know, as far as possible, uh, which has been recorded this month, which is great. Um, okay, let's talk about, from an author perspective, uh, Jasper. So when, when authors come to you, one of the things that we do at Fuse is I, I'm terrified of letting authors down. So I don't want to take on somebody's books if I think they can make more money themselves or even the same money themselves. It'd be yeah. point, pointless them coming to me. So I'm quite interested in what they've done in the past in terms of marketing. And uh, what I need to see there is a failed marketing history and, and an inability <laughs> to market before I'm prepared to take that, as well as the book being brilliant. Uh, yes. Take it on. Do you have a same sort of conversation with authors? Do authors come to you and you, you sometimes say to them, you know, you, you should be doing this yourself because you're going to be basically handing us a percentage of your income? Yes. Yeah, I mean, I sometimes joke that if there's terrible covers, when they, if they self-published, I'm like, great, they're terrible yes. covers. So yes. there's a lot we can add. Even if the blurb's awful, I'm like, yeah, there's we can do this. Yeah. Or they've got like titles. I mean, sometimes we change the titles and they got the world's worst titles. And you're like, then, you know, just give it a, a title vaguely within the genre and a cover that's not like made on, you know, I don't know, paint or whatever. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so yeah, the world, the worse the marketing, the better upside there is um you know the the thing you really do realize in the long term working with authors is some of them love being in control of everything it's about control um they want to be doing those bits and pieces they might not be better at it but they, they it's enjoyable for them to do it um but you can never see a book from the inside the way i mean unless you're a genius i think there are some genius self-published authors who really do understand their audience and they have such a great relationship with them that there's nothing we could add but many authors they don't see their book from the outside i I do always say this because it is actually really important they think of their book and they think of all the work and all the hours of writing and then when they're trying to market it they can't see what the book looks like to other people and what other people might like about it Um, and that goes through from cover to blurb to editorial you know because we are we are looking at you know what's it going to what's the final book going to be like how do we make it as good as possible and it's an immense it is a huge responsibility when you said that that really resonated you know i don't want to you know it's someone's work it's someone's it's you know like it's a year's worth of work you're you're dealing with you have to you know like it's it's, it's something you have to really respect um and you you don't want it just to sell five copies after all that work um for them and for you yeah um yeah, no, I, I think you're absolutely right about that. Uh, that difficulty of, of of being unemotional, seeing it as a product, effectively, and it's um, hmm. there needs to be a word for this because it's something we talk about a lot, and it's quite difficult to put it into words. But that you know, when you stop writing, if you want to talk about writing in the morning and marketing in the afternoon, 
of treating your afternoon business as if they're not your books. Um, yes. And I think Mark is one of Mark's secrets is he's always done that. He doesn't he doesn't feel emotionally slavish to his books. But I speak to authors all the time, as you do, who who will say, well, the color of the the color of the hair on the front cover is not quite how I see my character. <laughs> yes. and you think, well, this, this is irrelevant to selling your book and actually will cost you sales. And they can't yes. can't see that. And um, it is difficult. Yes, so like the location of the book is actually 50 meters down the road. Yeah, and, exactly. And you're like, well, I think this image is probably going to have more appeal. And I always say to people, before they buy the book, they haven't read it. Yeah, so, and they won't look at the cover again, probably. In this day and age with yes. e-books, you look at the cover for one and a half seconds when you buy the e-book, you never see it again. Yes, and you're not going to be like, oh, well, the woman's hair or the background or that guy was wearing a brown Macintosh, not the green one, you know. Yeah. <laughs> I've had all these conversations. Um, but yeah, but, but there's a trick, and this is a real good takeaway from this interview for, for people, you and me, who market other people's books. It's it's much easier for us. And, and we one of the reasons we can be effective about marketing is because we're not emotionally tied or, or we don't have that complexity of being in the middle of the woods. If you can stand outside the woods and treat your book, your book as a product, you've mm -hmm. given yourself a massive advantage, I think. I think so. I mean, I think it does also apply to editorial because I know many self-published authors do have, you know, freelance editors doing lots of work on their book. And sometimes they're the same editors we use because we do use freelance editors. Um, however, there's a difference between a freelance editor working for us and for you directly. They're less likely to be like, change this, do this, make this better because effectively they're going to lose their if you if, they, if you don't like them and you, you're you're employing them you're going to get rid of them but we say to our editors make the book as good as you can intervene as much as you can to make the book better and we can say that because we're the publisher but if you're the author employing them it's a slightly different relationship um you know because they're they're supplying a service to you effectively at that point and of course i'm sure there's some really good editors who do have amazing relationships i know that with their authors but i think as that that external objective feel about the book is so important, not just in marketing, also in editorial. Yeah, I suppose that's that balance between you wanting to tell this story, and sometimes that's a personal thing, um, and why, you, why are you writing this book? You're writing it for commercial reasons, so listen yes. to that side of it. And don't just put in like everything you happen to be interested in that week. I do find that sometimes, you know, like sometimes a writer is really good, but they have a particular interest, I don't know, in seagulls, and you get a lot of descriptions of seagulls. Mm. And you're like, well, the general reader maybe wants one expert opinion on seagulls, but not, you know, pages on seagulls. So, you know, maybe we can cut that out. I'm making notes for my sea attachment series, which uh, I'm, I'm always, it's, it's quite a seagull. One seagull mentioned is <laughs> One fine. seagull. One seagull per chapter, maybe? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Might be pushing it. Um, uh, what percentage of your books are are written for Joffy books and what percentage are, have been previously published uh, when the author comes to you? I think probably more than, well, because we, we do acquire quite a lot of backlists now. I mean, you know, we bought an entire company. Uh, well, basically their, their backlist a while ago, uh, Robert Hale books. So we bought 300 books there. So we, that took us a while to publish all of those books. Um, so I, more than 50% are new, you know, brand okay. new. Hmm. But we don't see, uh, you know, again, if you're in my company, you probably hear me say this. I don't see a book as backlist. I just see it as a book someone hasn't read before, yes. which is my catchphrase. But it's true. If you haven't read the book before, it's new to you. And you are like, wow, there's this new book and it's about this. And we market every book as though it's new. Because for the 99% of people who haven't bought that book, it is brand new. It's just a book you haven't read. Mm. Uh, and that I think is one of the keys to our success is just thinking of every book as important. Every book is requiring this really precise marketing plan. Every book you present as beautifully and brilliantly and is getting to the core of it as possible and presenting it to the reader. It's like, here's what's good about it. Here's this brand new book you haven't read. Yeah. Um, well, that's absolutely right. I completely agree with everything you're saying, but then that's not surprising because you're an inspirational figure in this uh, in this field jasper and i mean that you know right from the first time i spoke to you i've been really impressed with uh, with how you've run the company and and what you're doing and the fact that you go from strength to strength and every time we talk there's um accolades and bottom lines that have, have, have moved the needle it's uh, it's very impressive you're very kind and it's always it's just nice to hear it i mean it, 
I mean, yes, yeah, I'm embarrassed, but yeah, very <laughs> kind of you to say. It's my job to embarrass you. Um, good. Well, look, thank you, Jasper. You better tell people, first of all, where they can find these wonderful books if they want to pick up, a, you know, read a Faith Martin or Joy Ellis or, or your many other authors. Where, where's the easiest place? Can they go to your website? Yes, go to joffybooks.com. On there, we have all the books we've published with links to click through to where you can buy them in your, your local Amazon and paperbacks and ebooks. Um, and then on the joffybooks.com, there is also a submissions page. Um, we also, I should actually mention this, and I forgot to mention it because we've just, we're going to announce the winner very soon. We realized that, well, actually, Emma, our wonderful editor, said, you know, like the, the, the industry is not very diverse. Most writers are not. There is some diversity, but we need to work on this. So we created a prize for crime writers of color. Uh, we're going to announce the winner next week. We had some brilliant applicants, you know, and this is something we're going to take forward every year. So if you're a crime writer of color, if you come from an un underrepresented in traditional publishing background, we're looking for you and we'll be reopening entries next year for that prize as well. So, you know, all on our website is all the details of how to submit a book, how to enter our prize and all our books if you want to buy one. Brilliant. And we're honored, you know, like every single person has a choice about what they do with their money and their purchasing. You know, I actually don't take a single reader for granted. You know, they might be buying a book at 99p. I'm honored that they want to buy one of our books, you know, and proud of that. Yeah. That's great, Jasper. Well, look, I've taken a lot of your time. Thank you very much indeed. You've got a big team of 10 people to, to manage for the rest of the day. Yes, well, I'll go out there now. I'm in the office uh, and talk some of these things that I said to you because it's basically the same stuff I say to you I say to them it's really really nice of you to have me on the show again hey no it's our pleasure tell them to listen to the podcast I will they're, no, they're excited yeah they're done for the day um, brilliant thank you very much indeed Jasper and we'll catch up again hopefully in person at some point yes definitely James thank you very much this is the self-publishing show there's never been a better time to be a writer there we go Jasper Joffe uh, toiling away there in Shoreditch, trendy Shoreditch uh, in London, and an inspiration for us at Fuse Books as well. So, um, uh, the way ahead, Mark, as an old broken record, me, isn't it, going on about this? But I do think this is the way publishing is changing. The two parts of it will be indie authors in their pajamas in their bedroom, building their their fortunes that way, uh, their commercial businesses, and the other half of it will be organisations like Jasper's. Uh, Joffy Books and Fuse Books, our own, and and um, that's what she said. That's Lucy, Lucy, and her partner Tim run in the states, and so on, taking over from those big trads and starting to dominate the um, uh, the online stores and now the physical stores. We didn't talk actually a lot about physical books. I'm not sure if I talked about it at all with Jasper, but that's an interesting area. It's, it is certainly slowly becoming more accessible to to independent authors like yourself and Louise Ross and others. I'm starting to see your books uh, much more often than than I did. Well. Didn't see them at all, maybe four or five years ago. No, you wouldn't have seen them at all. No, so no, I'm, I'm, yeah, got a uh, three Milton books out. Well, third one will be out next year. We've got the the kids book, which I'm working on at the moment. The launch for that is going to be great fun. I've got a fantastic trailer. I've not shared it with anybody yet, but the the book trailer for that is absolutely out of this world. So I'm really looking forward to getting going with that. And and that will be. I saw the. Um, I spoke to Welbeck the other day, and it's going to be in Smiths. It'll be in Waterstones. Uh, I think Tesco's are interested in taking some as well. So that was the fun. big U UK stores. <clears throat> yeah, W. A. Smiths is is a, is a big bookseller. Waterstones is probably the biggest kind of dedicated bookseller. Um, and I've never had any books in there before, so they're they're a little bit difficult to to crack for the in the kind of the crime the kind of crime genre. But kids, they're they're, they're a big seller, so it's going to be fun to see that. And and we've got a. A fairly fun um, plan to get books into into indie stores as well. Um, mm. A little competition for the in, indie booksellers to to get them to prominently feature the book. So, look, yeah, looking forward to that. January is going to be quite a busy month. Well, you have to uh, post that video into the Facebook community at some point. I have Once it's that. clear, cleared and paid for, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Really, it is fantastic. <laughs> really, really good. And circling back to TikTok, there's, that's one of the uh, one of the ways that you know TikTok is unlike some of the other social media platforms is selling books for authors is the fact that at Barnes and Noble, they often have a table on the inside. You walk in saying you mm. saw this on TikTok. Yeah, um, you, do. Book, yeah. you saw this on BookTok. So that's really a, a good sign. Uh, just a reminder then, if you want to take part in that TikTok challenge, if you go to selfpublishingformula.com forward slash TikTok and sign up, you'll be invited into a dedicated Facebook group and you will start to receive video instruction on the five steps that we're all going to take together to set up our accounts and post our first videos in the new year. 
What a great news resolution to have. Good. You look like you're poised to say something, or are you not? No, no, no I'm, okay. I'm done. Okay, you're done. You're spent. Okay, well, that's it. Thank you very much indeed, Mark. Thank you to our guest, guest Jasper. Thank you to the team in the background who bring this uh, podcast to life every week. And thank you to you for listening. All that reminds me, all that remains for me to say, I should say, is this a goodbye from him? And dear listener, it's a goodbye from me. Goodbye. Goodbye. Get show notes, the podcast archive, and free resources to boost your writing career at selfpublishingshow.com. Join our thriving Facebook group at selfpublishingshow.com forward slash Facebook. Support the show at patreon.com forward slash selfpublishingshow. And join us next week for more help and inspiration so that you can make your mark as a successful indie author. Publishing is changing. So get your words into the world and join the revolution with The Self-Publishing Show.